aren't familiar with what we're doing, I want to kind of bring you up to snuff. I don't have any extra books. I can get more books. We have more chapters after this that we've been reading. And I am a church member. And so tonight we're going to be looking at that. I will pray for my church leaders. But let's let's start out so that I can get some folks kind of up to snuff with us, if you would. Uh, where we start out reading a tale of two church members. And the writer of the book is talking about two men who attended church together, and they had a lot in common. Michael and Liam. Michael and Liam, as they went to church together, they found that they really did have a lot in common, so they started meeting together on Monday morning to have breakfast. And over a period of time, their uh, camaraderie together, uh, they found that they had a lot of interest. They were both married. They both had children around the same age. They both loved sports. That they, 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 they were striving to serve God. But over a period of time, Liam uh, uh, came to breakfast, and he really wasn't eating, and Michael noticed that. And all of a sudden, Liam said, you know, I have a problem. He said, I, I'm just not satisfied at the church anymore. You know, the pastor's not feeding us, and that, 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 that leader, he's a hypocrite uh, in, in the church, and the, the, the one who, who's supposed to be a uh, foundation of the church, uh, he acted inappropriate, uh, he, he, he shouldn't have done that, and, and, and so he says, you know, I'm just going to quit the church. And so as he's sharing all of his thoughts with Michael, Michael didn't feel the same way Liam did. And so Liam simply said back to him, Well, Michael, I guess we're just two different church members. Because Liam was in it to get what he could get out of church. What could the church do for him? What could the pastor do for him? What was in it for him? He thought that he belonged to a church like it was a club or an organization. He paid his dues and he could pick and choose the things that he wanted to do in the church. And he totally missed the mark of what God wanted him to do. And so over the past several weeks, we've been looking at what it means to be a church member. We looked at what it means to be a functioning member. That, that, that a functioning member is that we are all different, but we function as a whole. Uh, foundation, uh, the foundation of membership is based on the foundation of love. That we will love God, that we will love people. When God plants us in a church, He does so, so that we can learn to love those who are in the church. Are there those that are unlovable in the church? Yes. There are those that are challenging to us. There are those who are easy to us to love, but we need to pledge that we will be the part of the church that will love all and that we will work together. The Word of God compares the church to a body. The body has many, many members, but it takes all the parts of the body to be able to function together. It takes the eyes to be able to see, but the ears to be able to hear, the mouth to be able to speak and taste, and, 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 and we, we need every part of our body. Is any of you ready to get rid of any parts of your body? No. Probably not. And as little as a part may be seen, every part of the body is significant and plays a role in the wholeness of the body. Remembering that this church is a part of a larger church, but this is the church where God is placed and we function here in Lycans because God has placed us as members in this church. Now, there are several things that we can look at. You may say, well, Pastor, there's many, many churches, but we believe that we are a doctrinally sound church. We look at the Word of God. We doctrinally believe that the way that we worship and the way that the messages are preached and the Word of God that are taught are doctrinally sound. One thing that's for sure is that we need to have a conversion. <coughs> Uh, going to church isn't just a, a club membership, but we need to ask Jesus Christ in our hearts to forgive us of our sins, and then we need to begin to grow. Some people may say, well, the pastor isn't feeding me. I, he's just not feeding me. Well, the ideology is this, that the Word of God says that when we were babies, we drank as babies by bottles and little things and, and, and food that was matched up and, and, and parade for us to eat. But as we become adults, I don't need you to give me a baby bottle and I don't need you to feed me. I'm old enough and I've learned my girls are old enough. They love to get in the refrigerator, right, Brimley? 
Brantley, you love getting in the refrigerator. I don't have to feed her anymore. She gets in there for herself. Amen. So I just embarrassed her. I didn't mean to do that. But we're having a little conversation about getting in the refrigerator tonight. And uh, so uh, she feeds herself. She's still a little, but she feeds herself. We as believers, we come together to be taught and to hear the word of God. But we should be feeding ourselves as well. Because that's part of growth. We talked about being a unifying member. And so we need to be in it to win it. But we also know that to be in it to win it is this. Is that as, as the world would say, is there's no I in team. That uh, uh, there's not one person, but we function as a whole. And how important unity is. And how that we need to crush gossip. And uh, the, one of the best ways to cr crush gossip is just not to be involved in it. Some people like because of their insecurities will like to talk about others because of, of, of their jealousy. They'll try to blow someone else's candle out. Uh, there's an old saying that says just blowing someone else's candle out doesn't make yours shine any brighter. And so it's, it's about unity and taking the pledge of being unified in the church. And uh, we talked about the church not being about our preferences. There may be some things that you like, but things will shift and things will change. And it's not about our preferences. It's learning to serve one another. So Brother Al, he asked me on Sunday morning, as he's, as he's leading, he said, what's in it for me? He was being funny. What's in it for me? Amen. Some people come to church and what's in it for me? Christ has called us to be servants. He came to serve. He, he, God Almighty, left heaven above. He robed himself in flesh, and he came to serve. Think about the Last Supper in which he broke bread, but he washed and he dried the disciples' feet. He came to serve. When's the last time that you looked at this church as an opportunity for you to serve someone else? Not picking and choosing what you want to serve. Hey, it's easy to serve when you get glamour and you get recognition and accolades. But when we serve because we truly see the need and we want to serve one another. The Bible says that the disciples were arguing, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus answered, he said unto them, he said, those who are the last will be the first. You want, you want to be the first, you want to be the greatest, then you need to serve. And we sung last week that song, Make Me a Servant. Amen. Humble me. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant for thee. In this Western world, we are educated on rise to the top, be the leader, have others serve you. Amen. And there's nothing wrong if you have your own personal secretary, your own uh, 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 administrative assistant. That's all good. Amen. But in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. Amen. We serve one another. And everybody said, Amen. 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 It's a joy to serve. It's a joy to serve. Now, I need to tell you, this week is a little harder for me to talk about. That's just being transparent. Um, you know, it, 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 it is um, praying for your leaders. And we're going to look at pastors uh, somewhat specifically. Um, however, as difficult as it may be to talk about, it's necessary. Because a good church is going to be praying for its leaders. Amen. So I, I like the way that, that um, uh, it opens up and gives a little bit of, of light uh, on, on pastors in general, not just me, or for leadership in general. Those who lead, and we have others who lead the church, and how do we need to pray for them? We don't know everything that they do. Do you know, it's not just coming to church and uh, uh, getting up and being spirit-led and not having any preparation. Don't work that way, folks. I know some folks may be upset to me, well, it's about getting up and just letting the Spirit lead you. I don't ever come to church that way. If the Spirit leads differently, that's all right. But I come prepared. I'm ready to share from the Word of God. Coming to see God work and move in our midst. And that's what we should want to do. Each of us have lives. Each of us <coughs> have souls. And uh, it is the pastor's responsibility, it's leadership's responsibility to care for souls. Sometimes one of the things that I 
I think is, I want to be living in such a way that we always protect everybody's soul. I don't want someone to ever be hurt if they walk away from the church and in return walk away from God. If someone walks away from God, it's their choice. Some people can be upset about the most minute things, and sometimes it's difficult to be able to just meet the needs of everyone because sometimes people's expectations are unrealistic. However, there are needs that need to be met. They are realistic needs. There are things that need to be provided. And we want to make sure that souls are taken care of uh, on every level within the church. So if you don't have a book, listen to some read. But would someone read uh, page number 43? And really, this is kind of going to be a longer read over to the top of 46. everything out, I see the fact that uh, as he's doing everything that uh, 
one thing that's necessary is for him to care for himself. And uh, we'll talk more about that later, but he, he is there and uh, trying to meet everyone's needs. Sometimes as a pastor, you hear what you don't want to hear. Uh, sometimes there's things that you're told that you can't tell anybody else. It's just a burden that you'll bear with other folks. And sometimes you don't really have the words to say to folks. And you have to be okay. We're not fixers. Um, only There's only one Savior, right? And that's Jesus Christ. We can't be a Savior. We can only be a messenger of the Word of God and be there and uh, pray with folks and be present with folks. It's, it's okay to be that without trying to fix it. And so uh, it, there, are, there are many ideas of what a pastor is. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, some folks can give misrepresentation of pastors. Um, you know, in our limelight media, some pastors uh, might share with you a few weeks ago there was a pastor in Africa that had staged a man in a casket at his funeral, and uh, a whole staging he raised him from the dead, and by his prayer he got caught up in it, but he staged it, and. Uh, uh, there are some pastors that, that they're in it for the money. I mean, you look at some folks and they live in extravagant houses and uh, extravagant things. And, and you know, so sometimes, you know, when, when folks hear of those words, and that is how folks share with their <coughs> pastors, unfortunately what happens, it brings a relationship uh, of, of, of people looking at pastors and not like Maybe they're in it for the money, that, that, that this thing is real, of God working and moving. And so it creates a relationship of mistrust. So how important it is to pray for our pastors and understand that uh, in every profession, there are bad eggs. You know, probably some professions, there are uh, used car salesmen, and, you know, those poor folks get a bad rap because there's been a few people that, that, that have been bad eggs is used car salesmen. However, not all used car salesmen are that way. So a, a bad rap kind of can't stereotype everybody with. And, uh, you know, there may be people that, that take advantage of folks in a particular way. There's going to be that in every profession. But God's way of doing things, um, when he chooses uh, ministers, it should be because God has spoke to their heart. And they're yielded to the Spirit of God. And they're in this thing because they want to see God work in people's lives. Amen. And I, I, I hope and pray that that can be exemplified. Not because of words that I say, but because of the life that I live. So I'm not really going to, I'm not going to really spend a lot of focus on that. I just want God, God to help us as a church. I covet your prayers. It's necessary that you pray for me as a pastor. But it's also important that you pray for your Sunday school teachers. It's important that we pray for our board members. It's important that we pray for those that work with our youth. Because, um, you know, uh, no matter what age, they have souls. And we want to make sure that we share the Word of God with them in such a way that it's rooted that the Spirit of God takes that Word and brings uh, life to it. As the seed is planted in their heart, that the Spirit of God brings life to it. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but... You know, uh, if you were to combat someone, if you wanted to fight against the country, if you wanted to fight against a, a particular organization, what do you do? You go for the head. You know, if you, uh, pardon me, but if you see a snake out there and you're not liking it around, what do you do? You just kind of smash it on the head, right? Because you know that head will kill. And so, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the enemy, Satan and all of his imps, and he's wise, he's been around a long time, he's an angel of light, he'll do whatever he can to destroy a church. A church that's particularly on fire for God. I want to, uh, yeah, there's a lot that I want to say, and I don't want to get off of my notes. Just this week I had someone talk to me, and I don't, I don't care where folks go to church, you know, I see a lot of folks, and I meet a lot of folks, and they knew, know who I am. But if they think that they're going to come to me and talk about their pastor, they picked the wrong fellow. I don't care who your pastor is. I don't care what you, you, you doctrinally believe. I, I'm not going to get on a bandwagon with you against your pastor. And so it was interesting that this person said to me, 
you know, about uh, this pastor and something that happened many years ago in this pastor's past. And, 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 and so I, I simply said, well, you know, uh, I've heard of that pastor and I heard a lot of great things about him. And so even if that did happen in his past, you know, I believe that if he's put that under the blood of Jesus Christ and moved on, the Word of God says that he is to be blameless. And so if he's blameless, then we need to give him that record of being blameless. You know what? I really quieted that person down really quick. They need to go really fast. But I had the sense that all they wanted to do was talk about the pastor and rip the church apart. I'm not into that. I don't need to blow someone else's church away and make our church look better. I don't care what anyone else is doing. I'm busy enough trying to take care of our church. You know, maybe that was different years ago, but where I'm at in my life is I want to see God work and move in our church. And so the best thing that we can do is pray for our leaders. Pray for those. And so I encourage others. If you have friends and, and uh, 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 you know, they seem to be dissatisfied, but yet have no biblical basis for it, you need to tell them you need to pray for your leaders. You need to pray. It'll make the world a difference. So I want to read, pray for your pastors and other church leaders. There on page number 46. All church leaders need prayer. I'll usually say pastor, but that can mean bishop or elder, or director, or whatever term you use. may refer to the senior leader, or could be about someone else in the time. The point is that we church members must pray for our church leaders. The previous story is true. All I did was change the names, such as the life of the pastor. This day's code was not talked about. He is isolated by some and castigated, castigated by others. He needs our prayers. He certainly needs our prayers for his sermons. We should pray that God would give him the wisdom, insight, and words to preach. It is an incredible task to speak and preach the word of God every week, again and again. There are those who will be listening to the preacher, but they need to hear from God. Pray for his preaching. Amen. I covet that. So he said that the story was true. Can you imagine that pastor? Everything that he went through within a day. And uh, I can tell you uh, from my point of view too, you know, when people hurt, I hurt for you. When there's a loss, I suffer your loss. Or if there's a loss in, in our church, if someone passes away, you know, I'm really through my own emotions as well. I remember in my very early years, my first uh, funeral here was my sister Marilyn Dietrich. And I remember when I come here to check the church out, she was a piano player, and it was on Easter. And she sang, Up from the Grave He Rose. And if you know her voice, it was just, it was out there. It was just, she, she was awesome. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, so visiting with her in the hospital, and I was young, and boy, I just thought, God was going to heal her. I, 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 I just believed and so she had to give me a little education. I don't think God's going to heal me. And this is what I want at my funeral. That's tough stuff for a young pastor. Especially when he's not wanting to hear that. Because you know what? We're dealing with our anxiety, our emotions. We're not wanting someone to pass away. But she knew something a little greater than me. At that time, I didn't know a whole lot about the hospital and things. And she said, I can't live on dopamine. I can't have it in my vein all day long, every day. It just doesn't work in my blood pressure. And so uh, I remember that first funeral. And she was in the back for whatever reason at that time. It's kind of how they did it. And uh, I remember just then bringing her in and just having that moment there for me of just being able to really mourn the loss of a church member and a friend. Just have that time. We all do that. We're doing that. But also all leadership is doing that from the pastor to everyone else in the church. And so being able to do that is so important and having time to do that. Then he moves on to the Word of God. Do you know how important the Word of God is? This is the place where the Word of God is preached and taught. And so I, I would like to think that my messages aren't just preaching, but they're teaching of how to apply the Word of God to our life. And how vital that is for each of us. 
Now, I recently had someone who told me, I'm finally going to a church, a co-worker, and she said to me today, uh, she said, I'm finally going to a church. It's like, like the word of God, they bring it to this day's perspective, and I understand it, and I know how to use it. And I said, you found a good church. Because that's what you want. Life application. If it's all lofty, if it's all just material that you're ritualizing and learning, then, then the Word of God has never touched your heart. And so we need to learn it. We need to understand it. We need to know how to apply it to our life. And so pray. We see a vast amount of people that, that come, whether they're young or whether they're old or whether they're living in a strong family unit or whether they're living in a broken family unit. Whatever it is, there's people of all different colors and sizes and ages and they're, they're, they come all mixed up. That's just how churches are. But then there's a responsibility of the pastor to preach the Word of God that it can be applied to their life. And so why is it important? Let me just throw it here. Why is it so important that, that Sunday mornings, I like to bring us after we preach at Sunday nights around the altar because we take that Word of God that has been given to us and then we prayerfully apply it to our life. How does this fit me in my situation? How can I grow in my life? So I ask you, pray that God will give me wisdom into the Word of God. Pray that God will give me timing, that the message would be just right the hour that is needed. I don't want to just bring a sermon that, that's just a sermon to fill time or to get it done, but I want it to speak to my heart. I want the Holy Ghost to minister through me that it may speak to your heart as well. So I cover your prayers. So being a church member is supporting that leader. You know, one thing that I learned a long time ago in my job, it's very important to support the leader. I'm talking about my secular job. When I work my job, what can I do? Where can I fill in? Where can I support? That is my responsibility. As we have goals and they cascade down over, my goals are, can be personal, but they have to be uh, intertwined with leadership's goals and getting to where we want to be to provide the best at what we're doing. It's that way in the church, too. The anointing falls down over the beard of Aaron, uh, the, the, the oil ran down, and then it ran down over the body. God anoints leadership so that it runs down over the body. And the body is blessed by the Word of God and lives by the, by the power of God. This is not only the pastor, but the Sunday school teachers. Pray for them. Pray for leadership. That God will give them the right things to say at the right time. Someone else read 47, the top there. Pray for him and his family. One of the So we, we as ministers, you know, we, we want to be blameless in front of the church, but also we want to be blameless in the world. But, you know, particularly working a secular job has been challenging to me because I want folks to say, he's a good man. He, he, he practices what he preaches. Uh, uh, I'm not perfect by any means. 
I live as you live. I still struggle with uh, the, the flesh and, 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 and ask the Spirit of the Lord to help me. And the Bible says that he must be the husband of one wife. That's important. And uh, must be vigilant and sober and of good behavior, given to hospitality and able to teach. And so as we look at that, we blameless, a high character, integrity, the husband of one wife, and then temperate, must be able to practice control. Do you remember in the word of God where Moses was leading God's people to the promised land? And Moses did one thing that did not uh, exemplify self-control, and he missed the promised land. What was that one thing? He hit the rock. He got water out of the rock. God provided, but there was still an accountability because of his lack of control. And so it's important that the, the, the leaders, the pastoral leadership, uh, uh, be temperate, uh, sober, sensible, moderate, good behavior, uh, hospitable, uh, must must be kind, uh, uh, must must be apt to teach. Uh, it's important that the shepherd feed the sheep. Give, give, give food, uh, 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 not, not in it for gain, not violent, but gentle, uh, not greedy of money, uh, not quarrelsome, liking to argue, uh, uh, not covetous, shouldn't be greedy of what others have, but, but thankful for what they have themselves. Uh, one uh, 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 who, who rules well and, and, and rules his house well, not a novice, but someone who sees and has experienced and must have a good testimony among unbelievers. So uh, when, when you're a pastor, uh, uh, it's important that you know how to rule your family. I'm going to tell you right now, not everything about parenting is cut and dry. Thank you for all you parents out there that gives grace because you know all about that. I fumbled and I failed already in four and a half years. How can you do that? <laughs> because it's not as easy as it looks. And so I, I, I'm thankful that God gives us grace. But we want to be a family that exemplifies love for God and strives to do what's right. And so there's a lot that I can say, you know, a fishbowl life, you know, I, I just ask you, uh, if you don't want to give anyone grace, give, let me be the candidate. Don't do my wife or girls, all right? Because I'm a little more ouchy on that probably. And, you know, we're just human too. And so pray for our family. We, we, want, we want to be, you know, we're desirous that even in our neighborhood that we can simplify Christ. We're desirous when we're out in Walmart that we can simplify Christ. Most of all, we're here, we want to simplify Christ. So we cover your prayers. So I want to read, pray for his protection. It's a lot to read, but go ahead. Read these words from the Bible about the qualifications of the pastor, the overseer. These words are not exhaustive. They are other, there are other passages regarding his qualifications. From 1 Timothy 3, 2-4, An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, a husband of one wife, self-controlled, self sensible, respectful, hospitable, and able teacher, not addicted to wine, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, but free, not greedy, one who manages his own household competently, having his children under control, with all dignity. Just to get past the above reproach, part of it, part is an accomplishment. The word reproach means to find fault. So to be above reproach means to be above finding fault. While the pastor is certainly not expected to be perfect, he is to have a reputation above most everyone else. When people in the community speak or think about the pastor, the thoughts and words should be positive and encouraging. That's quite an expectation to hold. On top of that, the pastor must maintain good self-control. He must be sensible, respectable, and hospitable. He must be a good teacher. He must be gentle and not argumentative. He must not be greedy. And to add, and to add just a little more pressure, his family must reflect a healthy Christian family. Do you see why we church members must pray for the pastor's protection? In the list of the qualifications of pastor in 1 Timothy 3, the seventh verse puts it into all perspective. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he 
does not fall into disgrace when the devil is trapped. The outsiders in that verse refers to the unbelievers who are not part of the church. In that context, the verse mentions the devil's traps. Let's not move past those words too quickly. The devil is obviously he that is the literal chief among all demons. He is real, he is powerful. But in a rare use of the word, the verse speaks of the devil's trap. If we understand the full implications of that word, we wouldn't hesitate to pray for our pastor's protection. A trap is something that is set intentionally. It means that the devil has devised a plan to bring the pastor down. He has set a trap. It means that the devil sees the pastor as a threat and one of his highest priorities is to take him down and to take him out. And the text is clear. The nature of the trap will be temptation where the pastor's reputation will be harmed. We should not be surprised that when we hear about a pastor's moral failure. We are grieved and heartbroken, but not surprised. The devil is setting traps for pastors. Anything he can do to bring harm to the pastor's reputation. He will still stop at nothing. Greed, adultery, anger, addiction, to catch a pastor in his trap. The devil is powerful. God is much more powerful. And God in ways we do not understand fully works through the prayers of the unbelievers. Through the prayers of the believer. That changes everything. We are church members. We will pray for the protection of our pastor and other church leaders. We will do all we can. We will do all we can through prayer to keep our pastor out of the devil's trap. Amen. Praise God. I think the thing to remember is this. It's, I covet your prayers, but the most important thing is for me to have myself on the cross. I, I can't rely upon your prayers, although I need them. I, I need to hide myself on the cross and for all of you pray for them. It also changes our attitude. You ever, ever pray for someone and you find that your attitude is changing toward them? Uh, prayer, it's just important. Someone want to read, pray for his physical and mental health. Is there any leading in the church? Will, will it's been told to get past his energy. He is only called for day and every hour. Because the demands are so great that the pastor often neglects his own health and well being. While no one is invulnerable to sickness and accidents, we can pray for the protection of our pastor's health. We should also pray for our pastor's physical health. In this regard, I'm not referring to the office of the of sickness, as I am to wisdom. The pastor has to make dozens of decisions each week that require discernment and wisdom. He needs wisdom to know what to preach and teach and how to present God's word. He needs wisdom dealing with us personally each week so he can best discern how to respond to the plethora of demands upon him. We, are, we who are church members should pray for the health of our pastor. He will, he will feel stress and pressure every day. We can pray that he will experience the peace that only God can give. Amen. Peace that only God can give. Amen. I come with your prayers. So I was reading a few things, and uh, I think sometimes as, as you pray for the pastor, you pray for leadership, um, these are some things that I, I think that I can share that are important. Sometimes the greatest challenges for a pastor is balance. You know, I think particularly when you're uh, working a secular job, you're a family, you're trying to balance everything out. Um, one thing that has been difficult for me is, you know, um, I, I, I admire and I'm not jealous, but uh, I appreciate how a lot of folks have their family right here. And uh, I'll tell you, the past four and a half years, I sure wish my family was close. And I just uh, say, hey, can we drop the girls off? Can we have a few minutes just to catch up on some things? And so, uh, 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 you know, just you bringing. Can still do that uh, what's that? You can still do that okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but bringing balance. You know, you want to have balance. You want to give yourself to the church. You want to give yourself to the preparation of things. But you want to balance out your job and your family. So just pray that God gives wisdom and bringing balance in life. And this is an interesting thought. You know, um, there can be times where there can be those emotional swings where you're with people and they just hit the very bottom and they've lost things. And the next, the next phone call or text can be someone just got that job promotion. So you're rejoicing. 
So you're, you're, you, these, these just uh, uh, swing and, and, and balances, and, and you don't want to be there with folks in that. You want to laugh with them when they laugh, and you want to cry with them when they cry. You want to push with them when they have to push, and, and you want to re relax with them and, and, and enjoy when they, they enjoy. Uh, and so uh, with all that, um, and I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't know everything about the Bible. I probably don't even remember some of the stuff that uh, I studied years ago. My brain just doesn't work that way. So if you're re reading in Nehemiah and you expect me to quote uh, Nehemiah to you, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's unrealistic. I can't. And so sometimes folks will say, well, you know what this verse says right here, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't know off the top of my head. So, you know, uh, just knowing that um, I don't know everything. But I'll certainly try to find it out with you. And I'll pray with you. And as Brother Craig said, it's really about seeking the wisdom of God in many, many things. Because we want God to move more as people. One of the things that our red pastors have to do is they have to love people even when those people don't like you. Well, it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> but it's our responsibility. And sometimes, you know, there's things that we just simply don't have control over and folks think that we do, but we just don't have control. Or I've not been let in, so I don't have control of everything. So just being able to know that a church of balance is a church where People are praying for its leaders. And I want you to know I pray for you. I pray for you. You know, folks may look out over the congregation and, you know, God's been really good to us. Um, reflecting back over the past 20 years, I remember times where our congregation was really, really slim. But God has blessed us. And we've seen growth. And you may look out and you may see numbers. But you know what I look out and see? Sometimes when people aren't there, I see that. And it hurts. Not because it's a number to me, but because I think that when the sheep are away from the sheepfold, it just is a prime opportunity for the wolf to come in and devour them. So it it hurts and it it worries because you want to see people do spiritually well. You want to see God work in people's lives. And I think sometimes the tough thing is. You can encourage folks and you can tell them and you can preach, but in the end they make their own decision. And when you see them making a decision that you know is dishonoring to God and isn't healthy for them and for their family, sometimes all we can do is just be there and allow them. But it hurts because you love folks. So that's the emotional part of being a pastor if I can let you in. But there's great things. When I see you getting blessed, God working and moving in your life, it blesses me. I'm not envious of you. I'm not jealous of you. Um, I'm happy for you. I'm happy. When you get a new car, I rejoice. When you build a new home, I rejoice. You just get a new home. Even if it's not, I rejoice. Those are good things. I like that. When you have a birth in your family or you have an addition to I rejoice with you. That's awesome. But we also have hurt with you. Because that's just the way God's made it. Because a real pastor of love is going to be there. And so thank you for your prayers. I am appreciative for this church. When I read of the statistics of churches and pastors leaving and churches closing, pastors are experiencing burnout, I will tell anybody, this church has been gracious to me and continues to be gracious. I still am far from perfect, but I look back and I just cringe when sometimes I wish I would have said it and did things differently. But you all are pretty merciful to me. I'm not sure if I would have been that merciful to myself. But thank you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. We love you too. Let's continue to pray for our leadership. Not only for the leadership, but also for everyone in the church. Well, we talked about that last week, brother. Because that, that part from the old church together is not the only thing for the faith and the leadership. Right. It's a thing for one another. Right. And we talked about that last week. It should not just be prayer, but it should be serving, but of serving when we see one another. You notice someone's countenance is down. 